it just occurred to me, Matthew, are you related to Chris Perkins? Oh, no, he is my dad, but no, no relation. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler, and today I want to talk about Dungeons & Dragons 5e. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. I actually have a guest with me, and uh, I've got here Matthew Perkins, who's going to help talk about the Lost Mon of Vandalva, how to cut down or cut the fat from Fandlin. Hi, Matthew. Hey, Fred. How's it going? Hey, everybody. My name is Matthew Perkins. I run a D&D YouTube channel with the same name. Who would have thunk? I've run D&D for Lost Mind of Fandelver a couple of times, maybe three times I've run it. And over on my channel, I've got a pretty extensive guide about how to run it session by session. My style tends to be pretty uh, bare bones. I love cutting content. I love it. Every time I cut content from a module, I grow in power. I feel it. So I'm excited to sit down with you today, Fred, and cut this thing to pieces. My Lost Mind of the Fandelver series is wrapping up, though. The last video is coming out on April 12th, where I'm going to be reading through all of the commenters' best stories from the Lost Mind of the Fandelver. So if you've left a comment on one of my videos, check it out, because you might get a shout out. So, Matthew, we have kind of discussed cutting away elements of Lost Mind of Fandelver. And I have, and I think you have probably said the same thing, either in your videos or with me, that essentially um, there's really only four locations that people absolutely need in the Lost Mine of Fandelva. And I was kind of hoping you would sort of point those out and, and why you think they are they really the only sections uh, that are or locations needed in the adventure. Look, I wouldn't say they're the only locations needed, but if I were to point to the bits where the story happens, the story happens when you rescue Silda in the Cragmore Cavern, the cave, the hideout. Uh, the story happens when you rescue Gundren from the uh, from the Cragmores in the castle. The story happens when you uncover Glassstaff's secret plot and the fact that he's working with these uh, these red brands and really oppressing the town. And the story happens when you get to the Wave Gecko Cave right at the end and you discover the four dispels and defeat the Black Spider. And everything around that is actually just kind of the road connecting those story points. So sometimes along that road, that's a good place to find content to cut and make your game go a little bit quicker. Now, with regard to the Lost Mon of Fandelva, probably the one area that I've always had the most questions about, and you probably find the same thing yourself, because um, I know you have a video specifically on Fandelin, and that is, what do you do with Fandelin? Because in the book, it actually only lists three locations that seem to be absolutely vital. And in the book, when you're reading through the adventure, it talks about Barthen's provisions, mm -hmm. the Lion Shield Costa, and I believe the the last one, which one is that's the Stone Hill Inn. And that's really the only locations they really spell out as being absolutely vital. What do you think? Well, I don't think anything's absolutely vital. At every juncture, if you go, oh, I like this or I don't like this, you can change it and you have the power to do so as a dungeon master. So in Fandolin, I try and think about it in terms of, well, hey, what's the purpose of Fandolin? Why are the players going here? And I can think of a couple of reasons. Maybe so that they have some opportunity to restock and to rest and they have like just a safe spot where they can go there and not get hassled too much except maybe the red brands, <laughs> the red brands will get them. Uh, but also it's the point of Fandolin to be there for quest hooks. They go there and they learn so much information about all these other locations. And I figure so long as you're supplying those needs of it being somewhere where they can recoup and it being a place where they can get quest hooks, it doesn't matter specifically in Fandolin how they meet those needs. So I don't care if they get this quest hook for let's say the Agatha at the old Alwell, the Banshee, right? Maybe they're meant to get that quest hook over at Sister Gorel. And so the module says, look, this, this healing place is really important. Uh, in my mind, the healing place isn't important. The quest hook is. I don't care where they get it. Maybe Barthen at Barthen's Provisions gives them the quest hook. Maybe, maybe some other NPC. Wherever they go, just put the quest hook in front of them. So in that vein, I don't see any locations or specific writing in the module about Vandalin to be particularly important because you can just move it around. Do you do you do that when you run your your settlements? Do you move content around? So when I ran the Lost Mine of Fandelva, that's 
a time when I was running Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League. Oh, okay. Yeah. It had just started and they did not really appreciate us making major alterations or even shifting anything around. Mm. So we had to sort of run it as was written. There were obviously if we went, if the players took it off track, we had a bit of leeway. But really, we couldn't add monsters. We couldn't take monsters out. We couldn't take creatures or NPCs out. So because of that, and because I ran most of uh, uh, Lost Mod of Fandelva on the occasions that I did under Adventurous League, I couldn't make adjustments. Now that mm. I see what I've done, I know how I would do it in the future. Okay. But I, when I was running it, I had to sort of run what I had. Yeah, that's a tricky kind of mentality and a tricky kind of restriction to say, as it's written in the book, you have to run it this way. Because, hey, that book's never met me. It doesn't know what my players want. It doesn't know what I want. And also, the books are kind of written to give you too much information. They're trying to prepare for all these scenarios that might never eventuate. They're going, well, what if the players go to this inn? Or what if the players go to the elderly farm? Or what if the players go here? Realistically, when your players go to Fandolin, they're not going to go to every location, are they? I wouldn't want them to. That wouldn't be a session that I'd want to play. Usually when I play it, they're going to go to a couple of things. They're going to get bored. They're going to fight somebody over something. <laughs> and then the story just kind of moves on. So to spread the plot hooks and the content around the town in a way where it expects them in order to get every plot hook, they would have to visit every location. That, that doesn't jive with me. It does not jive with me at all. So it's funny you should say that, actually, Matthew, because <laughs> when I was running Fandlin the very first time, my players, and I had seven of them sitting at the table, when we got there, they insisted on visiting every single location oh, no. in Fandlin and talking to every single NPC for the entire session, collecting every single adventure hook that was available, because if I didn't present it, they were asking me, well, don't they have some sort of Thing that they want me to do and <laughs> and i'm like i can't escape this can i and i'm the one i'm the dungeon master who's like oh this is just torture and yeah. they're like sweet we had the best time and this is the problem when you're running dungeons and dragons you always think that players will like something when mm -hmm. in fact the chances are you're probably wrong <laughs> <laughs> look they'll find a way to have fun the first time that I ran Lost Mind of the Fandelver, hey, it was a train wreck because it was my first time running d and I'd only played a couple of times. I just jumped into it with my friends. But there is one thing that I noticed about this, this whole town scenario is that I felt kind of overwhelmed with how much content there was. And I didn't really know how to do deal with that. So one thing I did is I kind of told the players, hey, I am not going to be able to do everything in this town. I was, I was pretty open with them. I was like, look, I'm not going to be able to keep this all in my brain. So I said, when they went to the tavern, I said, you guys have maybe the opportunity, the time to talk to two different NPCs about like in depth. Uh, but then at that point, I'm going to bring the story to you. And in my head, I was going, that means the red brand's going to attack or the red brand's going to do something shady that the players aren't going to like. So I said to the players, you have a limit. You can talk to two NPCs, which meant that they could get two plot hooks. And I described all the patrons in the tavern. I said, there's the barmaid and she's looking, she's looking sad. There's, there's the barman and then he's like fretting over cooking a pizza. And one of the NPCs I described was, and then there's this child in the corner with like the thousand yard stare and he's just drinking a mug of ale. Nobody's talking to him. He's got like a shadow behind him. You know, he's like really despondent. And they went and talked to all the people. And then after they finished it and like, it's like, okay, you spent all your time talking to people. One of them goes, wait, why didn't we talk to that kid? Oh, what an opportunity. And that was going to be Carp, the guy that had um, had found the, the secret entrance and he was harrowed by what he'd seen. Maybe he'd seen the Nothic or something. <laughs> so when I was watching your video on Fandlin, I thought it was very interesting, the locations and the NPCs that you focused on. And I was kind of, I don't want you to reveal everything because, you know, people can go and watch the video. <laughs> um, but seriously, how about giving us just a, a brief summary of your rationale for why you selected those locations and why you use those NPCs to communicate the information and sort of move the story? Yeah, absolutely. So what I did is I found all the plot hooks that I want to include. And those plot hooks were the red brands are up to no good. 
right? That's that's a major one. I need to flag that a couple of times. And then I had wanted to flag a couple of the the side quests. I wanted to flag the fact, hey, those bandits of Wyvern Tor, they're they're being quite shady, they're being mean. And there's a there's a banshee out there somewhere. I wanted to see those three. So and ooh, how can I do this? And what I started to do was just combine NPCs. So in the story is written, the players are delivering this wagon to Barthens Provisions, which is a some kind of general goods store, right? So I took that store and that character of Barthen and combined it with the Stonehill Inn. The players are always kind of one of the first places they go is, hey, where's the pub? Can we go to the pub? Where's the inn? I want to go. I want to go have a drinking contest. Players, degenerates. And so, of course, they get to town. They want to go to the pub. Oh, it so happens that that's the exact place you need to go to deliver this stuff. And Barthen has all of this information about the Red Brands. And one of the ways I try and see these quests is because sometimes you put a quest in front of the players and they don't care. And you have to find a way to make them care. My way of doing that is making some NPCs very sympathetic. So with Bart, he's really generous to the players. He actually genuinely likes them. He cooks them dinner. He has a cat. Players love animals. Bart has an asthmatic cat that the players are going to love. And in that way, I get them to care about Bart. And later in the adventure, if I go, well, look, they still haven't picked up this Red Band quest. Well, they cared about Bart and Bart was telling them, hey, the Red Brand's the real trouble then I can have Bart get abducted. I just give them something to care about and then I can make the plot attack that quest hook. Other things that I did uh, was I don't put a map down on the table, right? They don't see a map and go, what's here? What's here? What's here? Instead, what I do, I go, hey players, what do you want to do in this town? I give them the general theme, a general description, like it's a frontier western town, it's a mining town. And from that, they're going to make some assumptions and they're going to, those assumptions are going to be right because I'm going to say, yeah, there is a gambling hall in the town. When we gambling hall there and we improvise it, I just move a quest hook into that gambling hall. Maybe Sister Grell is out the front and she's going, hey, you guys shouldn't be gambling. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the way I do it. I don't run it as a concrete town. I think of it as the quest hooks I want to seed and I move those quest hooks in front of the players as is appropriate during the session. So something that I've struggled getting people to understand about Fandolin, because they see Fandolin and they think, oh, lots of goodies, that they don't actually have to use everything there. And what you've talked about is specifically the sorts of things that I think people need to be doing as they look at what Fandolin is, take what they absolutely need to use because that's what the players are pursuing and that's mm -hmm. what is going to drive the story, and anything else, it's not like you don't ever use it because it doesn't drive the story and the players aren't interested in it. But later on, if they come back, you could use it, but you don't have to. I think that's the thing that people need to take from the Lost One of Fandelva is that as you're right, there's more in here than you need to actually use. Yes. Yes, Absolutely. There's way too much. There's so many locations in this place. And specific locations that I will always cut are going to be like the, the Lion Shield place because why do we need two general stores? We've already... Why do they need two? We've got one. And there's the place where Harley Thornton works. We, we don't need that. You know, why do we need this second kind of a little bit less evil villain in there doing shady stuff? Let's not complicate our villains. We've got the Black Spider, who is very bad. That's fine. We've got Glassstaff, a little bit less bad. We've got King Groll doing his stuff. We don't need Harley in there just being <laughs> just in the background. It's not helpful. Yeah, uh, I like I like to simplify, and that's why I always cut stuff. Oh, and the elderly farm. Get out of there. We don't need it. What, what do you cut specifically? What would you cut location-wise? What do you not want in there anymore? I will tell you what I would keep. Oh, the things yeah. I would keep rather than what I would cut. There's only a couple of places I would keep. I would keep the Trestendor Manor, the ruins, because yes. we need that for the Red Brand hideout and that part of the adventure. Um, I would definitely keep the Stonehill Inn because there's actually a lot of NPCs. There's three NPCs built around that that actually give you a lot of ways of presenting rumours and information through the inn. I would just ignore the um, the sleeping giant tap house because the red brand's taken over that anyway. Nobody drinks there. They, they're all drinking at the Stonehill yeah. Inn as far as I'm concerned. Barthens provisions I would keep. 
And Bath and Provisions is a trading place. So I did, I would probably still keep the Lion Shield Costa, but you do make a good point that the trading center or Bath and Provisions could pretty much stand in for the Lion Shield Costa and you wouldn't need that. So you yeah. don't need to have that many locations. Everything else is just extra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, maybe they're thinking is they're going, look, we're not trying to make make a like a like a A to B to C story here. They're going, no, we want to make a living world. This is a real economy with real people and they've all got real lives and hopes and wants. So this is where this person works and this is where this person works and they're, they're competing shops. I don't care. I don't care, Wizards of the Coast. Just let me buy my shield so I can get my plus two armor and then I'm going to go kill some red brands. So I think Fandolin itself was built the way it was and presented in the adventure not to give you a whole lot of extra things to do that you absolutely had to run. I think the intention was that it would be a starting location. Mm. So they tried to give you a lot of additional information. And then while they were doing that, I suspect that the designers thought, well, well, let's talk a little bit about the NPCs and give them a little bit of information so they don't have to build that themselves. And then, oh, since we've built the NPC and they've got a location and they've got almost all the locations you would need for any kind of small town, well, let's give them all in an adventure hook as well that's yeah. related to something else. They don't have to use it, but it's there if they really wanted to. They could deal with all those things later. Look, my criticism of Fandolin is not necessarily a criticism specifically of Fandolin, because it's more of a criticism of the way that adventures are written, because I do think it's kind of ham-fisted to go, here's every possible option that can happen, here's a bunch of stuff that you're not going to use. Like, that, they are designed to be bloaty, and it's a criticism of that, that bloat. And I suppose that's a dungeon master's job and a skill that isn't really taught by the books to look at an adventure and just be able to pigeon pigeon to be able to eagle eye not pigeon eye to eagle eye which bits are important and which bits are important and that's a skill that you pick up over time and the bits that are important to you it's going to be different dungeon master to dungeon master you said that the sleeping giant inn isn't necessarily an important location for you with your players man i guarantee no matter whenever i run that game the players are going to go these red brands what are they like what do they love let's go to the thing that they like and destroy it I have run this game three times and twice they have burnt down the sleeping giant tap house just to stick it to them, just to stick it to them. This is where you like to go. It's gone. <laughs> this isn't really relevant to cutting the fat, but I have a question for you just about Harbin the town master. Do your players always try and become the mayor? Because my players always try and become the mayor every time I've run this. They go, we're going to get that guy out of office and we're going to take over. No, that's oh, really? not really been no, but most of the, my players have always considered Harbin Wester to be a cowardly piece of shite mm -hmm. that they would like to see removed from office and they are loath to usually dispose of him in, um, you know, out in the alley, out the back and dig a hole and bury him in the jungle or the forest or anything like that. So, so currently my players have run through Dragon of Ice by a Peak, which has Fandolin in it. Oh. And uh, they've actually taken over the role of uh, deputies and the constable of that location. So Harbin Wester is nothing but a figurehead. He means nothing. They, yeah. they run the town. So they have replaced him, essentially. He's still around, but I think that he's probably going to pack his bags pretty shortly and decide that it's just too hard to be uh, a retired <laughs> banker in a tiny little place like this. Oh, that's so fun. In in the Dragon of Ice by a Peak, because they've got Vandal in there, what have they changed? Maybe that will tell us, what did they cut? You know, what did they change? Did they keep all the locations from adventure to adventure? No, no, they didn't. They cut quite a, about half of it, actually. Really? Yes. I want to know what they cut. So in the Dragon of Ice by a Peak, these are the locations that they have kept. They kept the Stone Hill Inn. They kept Barthen's Provisions. Ooh, okay, yeah, that's fine. They kept the Lion Shields Costa. No, they kept no. the Fandolin Mining Exchange and they kept the Shrine of Luck. Okay. The only problem with the Shrine of Luck is um, Sister Gar Garlia or Garel or whatever the heck her name is. That's it. She's not in town. She's gone away. She's she's just not there anymore. So what? the Shrine is like kind of pointless. 
What a drag. That is a drag. Look, oh, I don't know. They kept some of the locations out. Who's right? <laughs> are we right or are they right? They're probably right. They've got the, they've got the printing rights. Um, that, oh, man. Sister Gorel is one of my favorite locations and favorite characters in town. Um, so it's a shame that she's not about. I would actually like to come back and talk about that Banshee quest and Sister Gorel at a later date, if you'll have me. Of course I will. In a oh. couple of months, when you're ready, we will come back and we'll talk about that. Because unlike um, your current way of thinking, uh, you're going to be doing Lost Mine of Fendelva um, videos <laughs> for the rest of your freaking life. You just don't <laughs> realise it. <laughs> you can't, can't trust, trust me. As long as Dungeons & Dragons 5 years around, there's going to be people asking you questions about it, and it's going to drive more traffic than anything else. So that's what you'll make. <laughs> it's, it's really simple. <laughs> I've got 46 of them now, so wow. you'll probably wind up with a lot more eventually. That's so fun. That's so fun. One thing I will clarify is that even though I'm not making specific videos about Lost Minds of Fandelva in this How to Run Lost Minds of Fandelva series, I am still continuing Lost Minds of Fandelva content and handouts and little write-ups on my Patreon, and I'm improving the stuff that I've made before, so any of my patrons can check that out. But the things that I'm moving on to, I'm moving on to guides about Storm King Thunder and Candlekeep Mysteries. And I hope everybody keeps an eye out for this last Lost Minds of Fandelva video uh, that's come out on the April April 12th. So check out all my stuff at matthewperkins.net. This has been so fun. Hey, thank you, Matthew. It's been fantastic. So go and check out Matthew Perkins. He has a YouTube channel. He has a lot of social media stuff. I'll put it all down in the description. You'll be able to find it. I'll put his videos down there as well. Not going to be a problem. But make sure to share, like, and subscribe, both channels. And hey, till next time, Keep rolling those twenties. Oh, now go. Yeah, keep rolling those twenties. <laughs>